You're right. Um, what is our next slide? All right. All right. What we're going to do, okay. What we're going to do to start off is just a little exercise about mindfulness. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to read from Adam Hamilton's book. So much of the anxiety we experience is a product of bringing the future into the present. We think about what could happen, what might happen. It's like cramming all of this future experience into the present. We don't allow ourselves any time in the present to feel freedom or joy or to engage meaningfully in our relationships. As a consequence of that, we feel anxious, we feel worried, we feel fear. The formal practice of mindfulness is geared toward allowing us to push away the depression or sadness from ruminating on the past and the worry, fear, and anxiety from thinking about the future, and instead allows us to be engaged in the present moment. So to start, we're going to do a little, a brief uh, mindfulness exercise that is involved with your breathing. So get in a comfortable position, legs uncrossed, arms relaxed, and close your eyes. <coughs> Close your eyes and follow the instructions that I will give you. Breathe in slowly as I count. One, two, three, four. Hold your breath as I count. One, two, three, four. Exhale slowly as I count. One, two, three, four. Hold with your lungs empty. One, two, three, four. Breathe in slowly as I count. One, two, three, four. Hold your breath as I count. One, two, three, four. Exhale slowly as I count. One, two, three, Four. Hold with your lungs empty as I count. One, two, three, four. Breathe in slowly as I count. One, two, three, four. Hold your breath as I count. One, two, three, four. Exhale slowly as I count. One, two, three, four. Hold your hold with your lungs empty. One, two, three, four. Now keep your eyes closed. Breathe normally. And we will have the opening prayer. God who breathed life into the first human in Eden, you are as near to us as our own breath. Your spirit moves within us and around us. We are grateful for this moment and this day. Take our fears and worries about tomorrow and our regrets and hurts we carry from yesterday. We release ourselves and our time to you. Amen. Okay. Okay, we're ready for a video? Yep. All right, I'm gonna try it. See if it works. You know, just takes a few seconds to come up. Can you see it? Can you see it over there? No. No? No. No, okay. Okay. Let's stop. Well, this is our last session together and our last conversation to about the things that we're afraid of and how we live unafraid with courage and hope in uncertain times. And we're going to talk about some of the most universal of fears. Uh, if you go back and study Buddhism, you find this is the beginning of the Buddhist quest for enlightenment was uh, the fear of growing old. How's that? The fear of getting yes. sick, the fear of dying. And then ultimately we're going to end, uh, the book ends by looking at the fear of the Lord, how uh, when we put our trust in God, 
somehow that, that addresses and affects all of these other fears. So fear of growing old, and, and you know, it's interesting, in the book I mentioned this, that folks who are the happiest people in many of the surveys that have been taken across the country are those who are in their late 70s up into their 80s. And you just think, how interesting is that? Our assumption yeah. is that your happiest years are when you're in your 20s or 30s, mm -hmm. but instead somehow when you're in your 80s, those folks on self-reported surveys are happier mm. than the folks who are younger. They've learned things, they've gained wisdom, their, mm -hmm. their sense of uh, need to achieve or accomplish has, yeah. has really fundamentally mm -hmm. changed. But I wanna take just a second to really focus on this idea of the fear of sickness and our worry or anxiety around, uh, around our health. And Ginger, I know that's been yeah. an issue for you. Why don't, why don't yeah. you say a little bit about so that? So 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis mm. and it's mostly been in remission for 15 years, but it's in and out. Um, and it's medically controlled to keep MS quiet. But, um, you know, five years ago, I couldn't walk unassisted. I had a bad relapse and steroids weren't working and um, infusions weren't addressing it. And I really had to face, I, this may not get better. This may, this one may not reverse. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it was the fear of not only change, the way that I was living life was going to change, um, but what does this mean to everybody else around me? It's a change for my husband. It's a change for my children. Um, and I remember coming up on a Jeremiah line of, I knew you in the womb and, um, you know, God calling Jeremiah to his purpose. And it struck me of like, okay, so no matter what happens, God knows me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not necessarily a person with MS in God's eyes. I'm a person who might be able to teach something to people or I'm a person that might be able to show faith despite um, major setbacks. Mm -hmm. And so just that message of Jeremiah's call story indicated to me, I know you, I know what you're thinking, I know what you're about to say, and I've got you no matter what your body does. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just felt like, use it then, God. And I really surrendered of, okay, so what do you want to do with this? And that's the time that I was feeling the call to seminary and, and the call to learn so you can teach. Um, and, and MS got better, um, mm -hmm. so I'm currently in remission, but I have that looming always, yes. yeah. um, always that it could come back. Um, but I don't live in fear as much because I know even if I'm not okay, it's gonna be okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, for you, it sounds like you gave that to God. It sounds like that you invited God to bring you, you uh, okay, this may not yeah. change. I'm gonna seek medical treatment. I could be terrified of it. Or I could say, God, take it and use it. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happening yeah. in your life. And there's no alternative in my eyes. Right. I mean, what is the alternative? <laughs> yeah, what right? is the alternative? God, all let's the time. do something with this. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. How about either of you? Have you had a moment where you were afraid of uh, whether there was an anxiety or panic or worry related to health? My, my mother uh, suffers from um, a severe arthritis rheumatoid and... A, it, it wasn't until like a couple of years that I started kind of having a little bit of the symptoms and uh, I actually noticed it while playing guitar at church one time and I noticed like my hand wasn't responding as I, as I, as I wanted to and immediately just I was completely in panic. I was so afraid because I started thinking about the genetics uh, of how I might be carrying uh, the same the same sort of illness and so um, and it was very terrifying to think about that I would end as I see her struggling with her illness. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Any struggles you've had, worries, anxieties, fears around health or? I see some older people that are able to jump flips and I'm not able to <laughs> and so like what, what's your secret for life for living so that you can get the best out of life and I seek to get that wisdom from them of what I need to do to maintain the best possible me that I can when I see um, be concerned about what how things how much things are going to cost the older I get mm -hmm. and when I step away from working mm -hmm. will I be able to maintain uh, my livelihood mm -hmm. and care for myself afford my, afford medication afford to go to the doctor afford mm -hmm. to do the things that keep me healthy mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I want to shift gears so obviously the fear of getting sick is uh, and the worry that goes along with that is is uh, is prevalent and of course most of the time the things we fear in that area never come to pass we right. you know or in your case right. you know you have MS but you mm -hmm. have been in remission and you've yeah. 
Let's talk about the fear of death. And here, I, I guess I'd like to ask, you know, you're, you're all three doing pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. And so where do you see, in, in the people that you minister with, uh, where have you yeah. confronted the fear of death? And, and, and how do you confront it? You know, I fear death less because of being a pastor with people in those last minutes. Mm -hmm. um, that has been the gift of ministry to me. It, because I had a huge fear of death. And part of my list of things I wanted to get answers to in seminary, that was one of them. What happens when we die? What's this afterlife all about? And um, so I've struggled with that. But being in someone's presence when they take their last breath yeah. and you feel that you know, spirit rising and, and people in the room are like, did you feel that? Did you, there's something happening beyond yeah. our ability to explain it or understand it. But I fear death less, having been with people in their last moments. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. In my pastoral ministry, I've seen the same. You know, we're, uh, we're wrapping up our time together in this conversation, but it just strikes me that in the Christian faith, the Easter hope, the belief that Christ came, he suffered and died, mm -hmm. and he rose from the dead, was God's way of saying, of, of addressing this fundamental fear in our mm -hmm. lives, that even death doesn't have the final word, mm -hmm. and that ultimately, we live. Because I live, Jesus said, you shall live also. Therefore, you don't have to be afraid. This has been such a meaningful conversation for me, and I know for the people at home. I want to thank you for giving your time to thank come you. together and talk about our thank fears you. and how we live unafraid mm -hmm. with courage and hope at uncertain times. It has been great. God bless each of you, and thank you again for being a part thank of the conversation. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as we come to the close of our last session together, I'm really excited to have the person who inspired my writing this book, at least one of them. And that is my wife and my best friend and uh, the mother of our children. A sign language interpreter is uh, her career, LaVon Hamilton. And LaVon, thank you for joining me. I know this is outside your comfort zone to sit in front of a camera, but I, I really felt like your story and your wrestling with anxiety was important in thinking about fear. And so I wondered if you might just say a little bit about what happened back in 1996 and, uh, and your wrestling with anxiety. Okay, well, I was in my mid-30s at the time, and we had two young children, and I got into a pattern of feeling completely obsessed with whether I was healthy or not, if there was something wrong with me, and I started worrying that there was something wrong with me, and as that continued, my heart would race, and I, my palms would get all sweaty, and I felt like there is something seriously wrong. And throughout that process, I ended up in the emergency room several times thinking that there, this is an emergency, there's warning signs going off in my head and I need to, to go get help. And as we continued to go through that process, I had a lot of phys tests done physically to figure out what is, you know, what's wrong with my body and they never could find anything. And as people would say, well, do you, have you ever thought about the fact that this might be anxiety or are you anxious about something? And I would look at my life and I think, well, I don't have anything to be anxious with, about. I have two young children and a husband who's a workaholic and never home and a career. And of course, there's nothing to be. My, my life is very relaxed. But I, I didn't pick up on the fact that this was fear and anxiety. And I, it was a cycle that I couldn't get out of. You know, it's interesting how many people wrestle with anxiety and, and panic. Uh, you've had conversations with folks, you've spoken about this before. How did you finally find deliverance from that overbearing, overwhelming, oppressive anxiety? First of all, I had to make sure that there was nothing physically wrong with me. I had to go to the doctor and have the tests run and, and then come to the point of saying, okay, I have to trust the fact that this doctor is telling me there's nothing wrong with me. So now what do I do? This is not something physical. Now let's focus on the mental part of it. And that was a long process. It was probably two years before I felt like I'm kind of back to my normal self, but it required me going to counseling. It required me talking to other people who had been through the same thing and realizing that, okay, these symptoms I'm feeling are the same things that someone with anxiety is feeling. I read books about fear and anxiety and it helped identify those things within my, my life and it helped identify my personality traits so that I re recognize the fact that I'm more prone to worry and to anxiety. It required medication and willpower and just a lot of work. 
to get back to the point where you where I felt at peace again. So I I remember uh, those moments where you know you were anxious about leaving the house or going to church or being around groups of people and the, uh, certainly not flying or going somewhere out of town or me being out of town. I needed to be there with you. But I also remember the first time we got on an airplane, you know, a couple years later. Actually, I remember before that, you flying to England by yourself. And I didn't think that would ever happen. And to see, you know, and today I look back and I think you're not the same person at all. But, but to see the progress, and I think there's a lot of people when they're in the middle of anxiety feel like there's no hope I'm never going to get better. Did you feel that way at times? Oh, definitely. I, I mean, I... It was all I could do to get into the car and go pick the kids up from school. And I mean, I was to that point where I, I couldn't do anything by myself. And I thought I, I felt like I was in this pit that I couldn't get out of. And I thought that it's never gonna be any better and it's better to just kind of check out of the world. I mean, I really got to the point where I didn't wanna go on because it, I had no hope that it was gonna get better. And it, again, it takes time and having to just realize that you can get on the other side of it, that you're not destined to be in that dark place forever, that through work and faith, you can get on the other side. Well, I stand in awe of what's happened and the strength and the amazing, you have a strength of personality that I don't think you see or understand. And to overcome what you went through, uh, to me is heroic. So I'm, I'm grateful and was grateful for you to come and, and sit here with me. I want to ask you one last question, and that is what role did faith play in, uh, in your overcoming anxiety, and what role does it continue to play in your life? Well, faith is a big part of overcoming anxiety. Even someone who doesn't necessarily believe in God, you have to have faith that it's going to get better, as we talked about before, that, you, that you're not going to stay in this dark place. You have to have faith that it'll be better. You have to have faith if it's a, a physical uh, concern that everything's going to be okay, yeah, that the doctor is telling you you have to believe in what they're saying. And mostly for me, as a person of faith, I had to remember that my life is not my own, that my life is in in the hands of my, of my Savior, and that I have to let go of any control that, any false control that I might have, and know that my life is in His hands ultimately. Mm. Uh, the four steps that I've been teaching in this book, uh, the acronym for, for fear, you've really captured them all in this. Face your fears with faith. Examine your assumptions in the light of the facts, which is you know having the doctors look everything over and see what was happening. Attack your fears with action, which is exactly what you did in counseling and finding people to talk to. And, and then finally, release your fears to God. And in so many ways, that acronym and those four steps are what I've seen played out in your life. I want to end this session by just challenging you and inviting you to be able to uh, trust in God, to be able to release your fears to God, to do all of these steps and to find all of the resources available outside of your faith, but certainly when it comes to faith, to be able to trust in God. And, and I think about this, the, the closing chapter in the book is about uh, the fear of the Lord. And that fear is, this, is being awestruck by God, by being awestruck by the power of God, that God is so much greater and bigger than anything you're facing and that you trust in him and that, that evil and sin and hate and sickness and even death will never have the final word in your life. And then to be able to trust just to hold, just this idea that God is holding you and near and will not let you go, I think is so profound. And I want to tell one last story here before we wrap it up. And that is, uh, that's our dog, Maybelle. So we have this beautiful, cute little dog. She's uh, seven or eight pounds. And, and she's terrified when there's thunderstorms. And I mentioned this in the book. She, uh, she gets really scared or if there's, if there's fireworks going off and she's trembling and she hides under the bed and the, you know, in the, in the uh, farthest, you know, reaches of the house. And, and uh, LaVon, you had this idea, you read something about the thunder jacket, and uh, that if you put her in this jacket and wrap her up real tight, it has Velcro and it just holds her tight, that she wouldn't be afraid. And you told me about this, and I thought, that is the nuttiest thing I've ever heard. There's no way that's going to work. And sure enough, you wrap this thing around her, and on the 4th of July, when the fireworks were going off, she wasn't afraid. She was totally calm because she felt like she was being held. And it strikes me that that's precisely what happens when we have our faith in Christ. We trust that he holds us. He doesn't let us go. And somehow we begin to find when we release our lives to him, a peace that passes all understanding to guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And when we have that, we can live unafraid with courage and hope. That's my hope and prayer for you. <clears throat> <Okay. clears throat> 
stop that. All right. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Back to the slides. Yeah, I gotta look for it. I'll find it. Well, this is our last session together and our last conversation uh -oh. together about the go. things that we're afraid of. I found it. Of, unafraid with courage and hope in uncertain times. And we're gonna talk about. All right. <laughs> it takes a while with this uh, program here. Okay. There we okay. go. <clears throat> oh, Jay. Sam. Go ahead. All right. So after the video. How has Ginger faced the challenges of her multiple sclerosis and what role has her faith played? What do you think? She faced it a lot better than I would have. Yeah. <laughs> That's honest, but yeah. 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 I mean, after hearing that kind of a diagnosis, um, I don't know how I would respond. Hopefully I never have to hear that, but she really, uh, she used it to her ability to help others. And it was great, you know? She felt that, you know, here I am, I might as well do something with it. And, and during this whole time, she's got multiple sclerosis and she's going for seminary. Right. Like, you know, most people would put that on the back burner and say, not yet, and when I'm better, you know? We always make excuses to do things. Mm -hmm. She didn't use it as an excuse. Right. She used it as a tool. It was very inspirational, what she said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and even though the fact that, you know, that, you know, she kind of lives with that it, it could come back at any time, she doesn't let that paralyze her. You know, she kind of moves forward anyway. Right. And that's a testament to her faith, because I don't think anything else could get you through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did the group members experience, how did their experience with people facing death affect their own experience with facing the fear of death? Hmm. Was Ginger the only one that said something? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, she, she and Adam Hamilton both said something. Right, right, right. right. The other two didn't say anything about no. fear right. Of right. What did Adam say about that? Do you remember? I think he just basically agreed with what she said about being in the room of somebody and feeling, you know, this the spirits leaving. Yeah. You know, it's comforting uh, in a way to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To see somebody else with faith dying. It's funny because, um, you know, working in a nursing home. Yeah very different perspective on things in life at, at different stages in your life. And one of the things that um, I remember is the first time I saw on our census that somebody died. And I went, oh, and like, you know, I felt so bad. And, and the one physician said to me, it's okay, Lisa, this is, this is the cycle of life. Hmm. And we all die, but they, we let them die peacefully here. They're surrounded by people that know them and love them and take care of them. And it's not a lonely thing. This is a natural progression. Mm -hmm. And when she said that to me, I'm like, okay, like, you know, I never thought of it in that perspective. You know, it, it, it's really, it depends upon how you are approached by it and, and where you are in your life as well. Mm -hmm. I had an experience at the veterans home probably 20 years ago, right where you're working, Lisa. Yeah. I got called about 10 o'clock at night by a nurse at the time that I knew there. And she needed somebody to come and pray with the gentleman who was dying. And it was, and he was going to die that night. Yeah. Well, they couldn't get, a, the family had left and they couldn't get a hold of a Catholic priest. I had just become a deacon and I had never done this before. So I went there very nervous because I didn't know what to do. But I had the occasional service book that is given to all the deacons and pastors have them. And I just started, and when I got there, the man was, was, comatose okay he was not awake 
he was comatose, but he was very agitated. And I just started reading scripture. And I could just tell he calmed down so much. His body just calmed down. And a couple hours later, at like three o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from the nurse that he had passed. Mm -hmm. But he had gone peacefully because of me being there and, and just reading the scriptures. I read a few Psalms and, and Matthew and stuff like that. And then I called the nurse in at the end. And I asked her, I said, would you uh, pray with me? And we said the Lord's Prayer together hmm. over him. And it was just, I'll never forget it. It was, you know, he just calmed down from the whole, and then he went peacefully. It was amazing. I just, going to stay with me the rest of my life. Wow. I get choked up when I talk about it. Yeah. Well, I guess that experience helps you dealing with it now. It does. It does. <clears throat> you know, I, I, you know, the older I get, I know faith, uh, death is coming, you know, but I try to live each day to the fullest and try to do my best, you know. Um, when they talk about the fear of sickness, I don't have fear myself. But I do have fear for my son because <clears throat> my son lost his eyesight when in his left eye when he was 14. And I'm always afraid that he's go something's going to happen and he's going to lose the eyesight in his other eye. And I just have to trust that God's there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I guess we can move on. What? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I, I, what steps did Levon take to determine that the problem she was dealing with was anxiety? To make sure there was no physical problems that she was having. Right. That was like one of the first things she had to do. Right, right. I think she also shared it with others that kind of helped her, you know, not holding it in and, and um, subsequently being acknowledged and verified, so to speak, that what's going on with her is very real and very true. And unless you've ever experienced a physiological change because of stress, it's very hard to understand that. We have to share our stories. We constantly have to talk to others about we've, what we've gone through because people will pick up on, well, I've been in that situation or whatever. <clears throat> Why I talk a lot. Yeah, I wanted to share with, with you all too that um, my mom was, she had brain cancer. Um, she's gone 15 years now. And when she was in the hospital, um, Tom and I were there and he had a call and he went out and I was just sitting there alone with my mom and my thoughts and I knew she was passing. And this only happened to me, I'm going to get emotional, mm -hmm. once in my life. But I had like a calming feeling just came over me. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll never forget the feeling. It was, it was the best thing and it made me accept, you know, her passing much better. It was just like a golden feeling. I, 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 that's the only way I could describe it. Just a calming golden feeling. And, you know, she passed not too long after that. But it was just something saying everything is going to be okay. Right. It's going to be okay. God is in control. That's exactly. Hmm. Exactly. That's why we always have to lean on our faith and the faith of others that get us through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Linda, were you talking? Because we didn't hear anything. 
Which Linda? Hill. Linda oh. Hill. <clears throat> Are you moving to a next slide? We don't know what's. We can't hear either one of you. I can see his cursor moving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, when we talk about anxiety, I have a daughter that lives upstate that's a school teacher. And right before the pandemic set in in February, she was out of work for over two weeks with anxiety. And that all developed in the beginning because she kept seeing the news about how the pandemic was starting and getting, and she was very nervous. And um, I mean, she's, she's come a long way in the, in the 11 months since then, but it was very hard for her in the beginning with the anxiety of everybody getting sick and everything. But, um, but she also leaned on her faith. You know, that's, yeah. Master and Linda, we still cannot hear you. Can't hear you now. No. Did you maybe hit a mute button by leaning on the computer by accident? I'm unmuted now again. Okay, that's, uh, we got gotcha. you. Yeah, it, right. um, it, it, it didn't show up as muted, but no. it, it works, it works. Okay. Yeah, it didn't say it on ours either. You're back. Good thing I could see your lips moving, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Can you still hear us? Yes. 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 Okay, so we were up to, I think, how did Levon's faith that her life was in the hands of her Savior help her to overcome her anxiety? Hmm. Any thoughts on that? No? Well, she acknowledged her faith. And she talked about it with other people, like Lisa was talking before. That she was able to share her story. Uh-huh. And, and, you know... <laughs> The more you share your story, the more less anxious you are, mm -hmm. you know, um, and the more you, you open up to other people, you know, like, like Linda, you just opened up about your mother before. And I know it's a hard thing to talk about. It's hard for me to talk about certain things sometimes and I choke up. But the more we talk about these things, um, even with small groups, it helps us um, in our faith journey. I believe in that. So that's, it helps me get through my day. Yep. Yep. And it helps other people too. Definitely. Absolutely. Yep. All right. Let's move on. Maybe. Hopefully. Maybe. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> ah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um. Did you all read in the beginning the the Harthos? Is that right? Said Arthur. Did Arthur's, did Arthur's story about the. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Good. You know, I don't know if we need to read the whole thing. Well, I want you to start. Want me to read it? Okay. Okay. I'll start here. Um, I'm on page. 173 in the second paragraph. Oh, it says it right there. Okay. When St. Arthur's was a young man, he felt compelled to leave his privileged life in order to see his father's kingdom and to meet the people over whom he would someday rule. Although his father sought to keep him from seeing the pain and adversity of life on his journey, St. Arthur saw an elderly man who was hunched over as he walked, troubled, Said Arthur asked his, his charioteer about old age. Will this evil come to me also? 
Upon learning that old age was in fact the fate of all people, Siddhartha became deeply agitated and wished to return to the palace. Later, finding no happiness in his palace, Siddhartha once more journeyed out into his father's kingdom. This time he saw a man afflicted with disease, a swollen belly, his arms hanging loosely at his sides, skin pale and yellow. Once again, the young prince asked his charioteer, are all beings alike threatened by illness? Upon learning that all people might contract illness like this, Siddhartha became deeply distressed, distressed and all joy departed from him. He once more asked to return to the palace. Later, seeing his son despondent from the thought that all human beings will grow old and get sick, Siddhartha's father planned another excursion from the palace, this time with singers and dancers along the road, and he gave clear instructions that no one sick or aged should be seen by his son. Yet on this journey, Siddhartha encountered a dead man being carried along by four of his friends. Having never seen death up close, the young prince once again turned to his charioteer and asked if death would eventually come for all. The charioteer replied that death was the fate of all human beings. Siddhartha, according to Buddhism's sacred texts, mm -hmm. then immediately sank down overwhelmed as he pondered the fate of all human beings. He was suddenly aware of these three somber truths. We all grow old, get sick, and one day die. Okay, I think that's enough of that. Is that it? Well, there, um, no, that's, that's the end of his story. Yes. Okay. Okay, so one of, <coughs> recall one of the first occasions when you were confronted with the reality of life and death. How did it affect you? And who helped you deal with what you were feeling? Hmm. My very first that I can remember, I was 10 years old and my grandmother passed away and I was devastated. I was just beyond devastation and my mom did not allow me to go to the funeral. She wanted me to remember my grandmother the way I remembered her. Because back in the day, that's what they said. <laughs> right, right. But I remember just feeling so sad. And I don't recall having a true understanding of what death really meant. I just knew my grandmother was no longer going to be around me. Mm -hmm. So the reality of life and death was that death was you're here no more. And that was all mm -hmm. I really had. Wow. Okay. I remember, <clears throat> I remember when my grandfather died, I was, uh, I guess, at that point, I was eight going on nine. And um, uh, he was living down in Florida. So my father and my uncle went down there. And then they had the funeral back on Long Island. And I remember going to the funeral home and we were uh, driving in the car and uh, the radio was playing and I heard some music on the radio. And every time I hear that music again, even now, uh, I'm brought right back to that day uh, going into the funeral home, uh, remembering that. One of the things that made, made me sad was the fact that one of the last memories I had with my grandfather was that he took me fishing and I had caught a fish. It's the only fish I've ever caught in my whole life, by the way. And uh, I caught that fish and I was so proud of it. And he took the fish off the hook and he said, oh, it's very small, let's put it back. And he threw the fish back. And I got very, very angry at him uh, because he you know, took my trophy and threw it back. And uh, since then I've never caught another fish. So there you go. Yes, you have. It just wasn't the fin kind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So it did affect me. Yeah. Yeah. Still does. Yeah. Yeah. When I was a teenager, like maybe 13, 14, my grandfather had passed away in May. <clears throat> and he had had heart problems. Um, so it was almost like expected. And we got the call during the night that he passed. Yeah. But now that was May, that December. And we had my grandmother living with us at that point. And that December, that was like, you know, oh, he's older. Okay. But he was my age, probably. Anyway, my, his son, my uncle, my father's brother, 
43 years old, died suddenly of a massive heart attack in his home. Mm-hmm. That really shook me because my cousin, who was my age, a, a girl, I cried. She wasn't going to have her father to walk her down the aisle. And it was, wow, it's not just old people who die. It was like that realization for me. And, and yeah, that, that, that really bothered me for years, years. I was always afraid something's going to happen to somebody else that's not old. Yeah. And then through the years, it has. Molly's husband died at 43. Yeah. That, that was a, a shocker to me. My mother-in-law was only 55. That was quick and sudden. Sudden. Mm-hmm. And we just I just found out yesterday uh, yesterday that Sunday, a friend of mine that we worked that I worked with for many years uh, when I worked for the Navy and when I worked at the FAA um, passed suddenly. And I was in contact with her all the time on Facebook. And like every day I read she's one of those people that like write what she did every day. Right. You know, one of those people. Mm-hmm. But I enjoyed reading what she was doing because they had moved up to New Hampshire she just turned 70. She had lost over 100 pounds over the last year and a half. <clears throat> her, her um, uh, what do you call it? Diabetes went into remission and she was eating healthy and she suddenly died. And, and, and it's like, what do you do? You know, what's the right thing to do, you know, to keep yourself healthy and alive? But it's in God's hands. I, I, I have to truly you know, understand that now. It's in God's hands. Absolutely. I was fortunate and I didn't have anybody, any grandparents or anything die when I was, was when I was young. My grandfather didn't die until I was married and I was about 25, 26 at the time. So he, he was in the seventies um, when he died. But the, di- the, the death that affected me the most was when I turned 37. My next door neighbor, who was my full-time babysitter, had an 18-year-old daughter who had um, asthma. And she had graduated in 1989, uh, 1988 in the summer. She went to college in September of 1988. She came home for Christmas break. And... Um, January 9th of 1989, she had an asthma attack at home. And prior to this, every time she had an asthma attack, the ambulance would come and take her to Brookhaven, would stabilize her, and then take her into LIJ. Well, this time they couldn't stabilize her. And so by the time I I was finishing doing dishes, for whatever reason, I walked over to Marsha's house next door and um, the paramedics couldn't save her. She was, when they brought her down on the stretcher from upstairs, um, she were, had already passed really. And uh, so I followed the ambulance to the hospital and I get to the hospital and um, Marsha's, they have all the family in a, in a separate room. And Marsha comes to me and she says, she says, tell them to wake her up, tell them to wake her up. Mm. And uh, they couldn't, it was too late. But um, that was 1989, and that's that's the one death that's always affected me. Wow. Sure. Yeah. Terrible. You know, unbeknownst, unbeknownst to me at the time, my Trisha, who's 36, 37 herself right now, she was five at the time. <clears throat> and um, I didn't know that she had such a close relationship with Vicki. And um, we wound up having to have the social worker at school talk to Patricia quite a bit because Patricia at the time, at the age of five, took it very bad. Anyway. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So why don't we move on? Okay. All right. Okay. So now they're going, we're going to look at some Bible passages from Luke. Has to do with aging. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not aging. I'm going backwards. <laughs> <laughs> aging is a good thing. It's when you stop that it's a problem. That's true. Right, right. You got to keep moving. All right. Do I have a volunteer to read? <clears throat> Anybody there? 
I'll read. <clears throat> okay, Luke 2. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing, dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all, who are looking for the redemption of Israel, of Jerusalem, sorry. Hmm. Okay, so what does the Bible tell us about who Simeon and Anna were? Well, they were old. <laughs> <coughs> they were faithful and devout. They spent a lot of time hung out in the temple. hanging around the temple. <laughs> Keep in mind, the temple was a, a, a very large open area where people would come and go all day long. Right. So what what role do they play in the story of Jesus? Well, they were the ones who, who recognized who he was, right? They, they had been waiting and, and they're, they're Prayers were answered, right? Yes. Simeon kind of introduced him to people. Yes. It's kind of is coming out, right? <laughs> it's funny. The vision I had was the one from Lion King holding up the baby. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So how, they, how are they using their time in their old age? And how are they models of God's intention for us in our old age? You know, it's funny. They, they were surrounding themselves with, with their faith. And as I look at my faith journey, the older I've gotten, the more involved I've become, and the more I surround myself with the people in my faith. Hmm. Yeah, it's important. It's important when we think about faith to recognize that faith is not simply something an individual has. It is something we share in a community of people and mm -hmm. a community of believers. And um, and so just like just like if you're looking out at the ocean and you watch the waves coming and going, there'll be times when they're high and other times when they're low. But uh, mm -hmm. but they keep coming. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a lot of what, you know, that's a lot of my image of what the church is about. It keeps flowing, comes in and out, but mm -hmm. keeps, uh, it has a rhythm, has a pattern, has a life of its own. And you can't be discouraged when those waves are low. No. You have to keep going, just as those waves keep going. Yeah. So... Models for us in our old age. Keep going. <laughs> when are we going to get old? That's a real I question. Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Never. <laughs> you know, that's that's one of the things that, you know, 
I ponder a lot, especially as I get older. And uh, you know, I, there are school teachers, for example, who retire when they're 55 years old. Can you imagine that? Yeah. I can't even remember when I was 55 years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost 20 years ago. My goodness. Yeah. Retire. Time to get new tires. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's all relative. Time to go to sleep. Time to rest. All right. Let me move on. Okay. All Moving right. On. Moving along. Okay. So then he wants us to apply the FEAR acronym for considering the possibilities of of old age. Face your fears with faith. How does my faith or the Bible help me face the fear of aging? Hmm. You know, after reading that chapter, I, I don't struggle with this fear, the fear of, of um, aging. I don't know why I just don't. My husband does. And I want him to read that chapter in the book. But I, I was like, wow, you know, when, you, when you're reading things, it really enlightens you that all the things that they were talking about were done by older people, you know? And, yeah. and it's so true. Like, you know, when I was in my 20s, I did a lot of stuff, but it wasn't for me. It was for everybody else in my family. Right. And I remember when I was in my um, late 30s, early 40s, I was like, who am I? Who is Lisa? Like I needed to redefine who I was because for that time period. So I think aging, the Bible has shown us that, you know, there are people, we go through stages in our life that we are learning and, and, and um, sharing with others that aging is just a, a, a great, you use, like my grandfather used to say, youth is wasted on the young. I'll never forget that. I was a kid when my father told me that because when we're older, we don't have the energy to do everything that we've learned. <coughs> But we have the knowledge to do things, so we have to share it with others. But it's just, I, I think the Bible just showing that it was the elders that were very productive in, in doing things kind of helps. Yeah. Right. Yeah, look at yeah. Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. The whole nation of Israel got started to them. Right. And right. I didn't think about it until I read that chapter. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, what he said, too, about the surveys about people being most content. You know, I thought that was very interesting too, as, as, as they're older, you know. And in a way there are things that you, you don't worry about as much as you did. You know, you don't worry as much, well, you still worry about your kids, but not as much. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't worry so much about money. You know, there's a lot of things that you don't, I don't worry about driving to work in the snow anymore, believe it or not. <laughs> right, me either. <laughs> you know, I was really worried about dying when I became a mom. When I first had my daughter, Alicia, I was petrified of dying. Mm -hmm. And that was because I knew that this human being relied on me to survive. Now that I know my children can survive on their own, I don't fear it anymore or as much as I did. Mm -hmm. But back then, I really feared it. And that was the reason why. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you, Lisa, because I remember that being me and Mully used to talk about that all the time. Um, we were younger, much younger, and yet we had a fear of dying because yeah. we had children. What's going to happen to our kids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could relate to that. Yep. Oh, it's kind of like being on a roller coaster and you're on the upward bound part of it. And if it is a, a long upward bound part of it, then you know that something is going to be there on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be really quick and scary. Hmm. But when you're actually going down, it's a thrill. It's scary. <laughs> it's a thrill. It's so... right, right, right. All right, moving along. Okay, so how can we attack our anxieties with actions? And how do we release our cares to God? Hmm. Well, what I think... One of the things that make aging less scary is getting up in the morning. <laughs> right. <laughs> God woke me up again. Yep. Yep. I think one of the things that I have started doing, and um, probably like 
quite a few years ago is I do a lot of prevention. I do a lot of prevent, I go to all my preventative medicine visits, you know, to make sure that I'm, I'm going to be healthy down the line. Like I remember when I was a kid, I was in my, I was before I was married. So I was in my early twenties or something. And I was smoking, I smoked cigarettes, but every cigarette I had, I kept saying to myself, you're giving yourself cancer, but I still smoked it, but I was very aware of what I was doing. And then when I became, you know, more aware, I, I started doing things for the health of, of this where I'm at now, you know, not know, well, knowing that this is where I wanted to be, a healthier person. So I think I, um, I think that makes it less scary for me because I see people who are older, like my grand grandparents and aunts and uncles lived in Florida. They live to be in their 80s and 90s and healthy. And I'm like, well, I want to get there. You know, so I kind of like gave that myself a goal. Like, I'd like to sign up for that age, but I want to be able to do things. So, you know, I exercised at some points in my life. Um, I, I, as you all know, I'm on that wellness lifestyle that I've been on for three years now. And I feel great and I feel better now than I did ever in my entire life. And a lot of it is mind and body. So it's, um, that's what makes it less scary for me, I think, because I feel like I'm going in the right path to do things. I don't want to get arthritis, so I move, you know? I try to do everything prevention, and I think that's what helps me. Plus, it's in God's hands. I always believe, you know, his path is where he leads me, not my path. Yep. Yep. Like you were saying, Lisa, the same thing. Um, I make sure I go to all my doctors, mm -hmm. um, even if something isn't wrong. Up oh, time for a follow-up. Mm -hmm. which today I'm having a little anxiety because I was supposed to see my cardiologist just as a follow-up, but I can't get out of my house with my foot. I, I can't, until the snow is gone enough yeah. that we can maneuver me out, I can't do it. I physically can't do it. So all day I've been thinking, oh my gosh, I hope everything's okay. Oh my gosh. But then I'm thinking back the night of the fire here in the house. Um, <laughs> I went into the hospital for mild smoke inhalation they had me hooked up to everything, heart monitors and everything. And everything was fine. I was there for over an hour that they were monitoring everything. So I went, I think I must be okay. <laughs> I think I must be okay. Yep. So um, I have to tell myself, yeah, you know, calm down, calm down. Yep. And uh, it's, yeah, but I, I do. And 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 what is one of the things though right now that that's with my foot, a lot of the problem is my RA. It slowed down that healing. Mm -hmm. And then to be told, yeah, well, your RA, I've got, they found more arthritis in my foot. It's like, what am I supposed to do? I can't control that other than going for my infusions. And even that mm -hmm. is just controlled just so much. But I got to make sure I'm going. That's it. Do what the, it, it, it reminds me of God with the, um, the flood, the guy in the house. Yeah. You know, yeah. he sent the rowboat, he sent the helicopter. Yeah. Well, there's my rowboats, there's my helicopters. I gotta go to my doctors. Go to them, go to them when you're being told to do this or do that. And he knows what I need. And when it's time, that'll be it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. But that's it. That makes it less scary for me, though. Yes. Yes. Doing, doing all my, my follow ups and right. doing right. what the doctors are telling me. Yep. But well, the whole issue with losing weight, though. Lisa, help! <laughs> Lisa was my Lisa was such an inspiration to me at the beginning. Oh, Lisa, <laughs> you there? <laughs> I got to get back on it. <laughs> on. Oh. Okay, when older seems happier. Okay, page one eighty one. Oh, this is kind of what I was talking about before reasons why older people seem happier. That's page 181. Mm -hmm. They have more reasonable expectations. They have more appreciativeness of what they have. They have more time to spend with family and friends. They tend to have time for hobbies, travel, and other leisure activities. They feel less pressure and stress to meet others' expectations. They tend to have fewer negative and more positive emotions. The breadth of their life experiences leads them to be less overwhelmed by adversity. So do any of these seem surprising or have you seen any recently confirmed? And what other reasons would you, might you add 
to the list. <laughs> what do you think? I laughed because like I was saying before, when I was taken, when I started exercising and stuff, the one thing that um, I chuckled at as I was reading was, um, where is it? That they, they feel less pressure and stress to meet others' expectations. It's like, you know what? I need to meet my own. Mm -hmm. I was tired of being that person, that daughter, that wife, that mother. Like, you know, what do, you, what do I expect from myself? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I yeah. Stuff, wholeheartedly. Yeah. A certain freedom. There is a certain freedom that, that comes with it. I use the excuse I'm old now, you know, I'm, I'm entitled to what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't have a hidden agenda. You know, um, I try to please people, but, you know, I please myself first. If I want to do this today, I'll do it. But. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Kind of that, you know, it's okay, you know. Yes. Right. You don't have to do things a certain way or be a certain way, you know. Right. Yep. It doesn't really matter. Right. In the big scheme of things, does it really matter? Yep. Yep. All right. Well, yeah, I would just on. add one, one uh, reason to the list, and that is uh, having a sense of mission. Mm -hmm. Having a sense of mission, you know, that, that there's a purpose for me to keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, tomorrow is important, not just today, and so on. Right, exactly. Yeah, I agree. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So, oh, yeah, we're not oh, going to have time for this. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you know, he talked a lot about the drugs and the, you know, ads that we see on TV and how they affect us. And I think you would all agree, if you watch any daytime TV, it's like one ad after another. It's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the doctor still has to prescribe it. So I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's funny that. Yeah. You see yeah. something on TV and say to the doctor, I have to have this, I have to have this. And the, doctor, what? <laughs> the doctor's going to listen to you say that. Yeah. Or we go, oh, I'm on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we move beyond the ads right. of the pharmaceutical companies? Uh, this is much better. Okay. Come up with an ad for prayer as a response to the worry about illnesses. That's kind of a fun thing. What promises does God make about prayer? What visuals will accompany your ad? What are possible side effects? Hmm. Well, definitely a side effect would, would be um, uh, less anxiety. Right, would be reduced anxiety, very good. Peace of mind. Longer life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. A future. A future, right. Visuals would be like the background I have. <laughs> yep. 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 Very peaceful. Peacefulness, yes. Positivity. Yep. And the promises that God would make um, is that you are never alone. Right. Absolutely. Right. Right. You're never alone. Right. Very good. Okay. Then we go to Levon's story about anxiety. Okay. She gave quite a spiel there. If you had the symptoms Levon describes, would you consider that anxiety might be involved? How familiar are you with anxiety disorders? And what do you appreciate about the way Levon relates her experience? Hmm. I thought she was very brave to share all of that. She really went through a lot. And she didn't give up. Mm -hmm. you know, she, kept, she kept, you know, even though she went to seminary late and everything, she... We're talking about Levon. We're talking about Levon. We're thinking of We're talking about oh. Oh, I'm thinking of the other lady, right, right. Yeah. Yeah the, yeah, the wife. Yeah. Yeah. Well, LaVon didn't give up. Nope. No, no. No. 
And I thought it was interesting too that she didn't complain about her pastor. <laughs> she complimented him actually, didn't she? What's that? She complimented him, didn't she? Yeah, well, it, you yeah. know, it's a tricky thing, you know, for the wife of a pastor to be in that position, you know. Mm -hmm. Who do they go to for to be, you know, as their pastor? Right. 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 They're kind right. of stuck. Right. <laughs> and, and I think people don't realize how debilitating anxiety disorders can be. You know, right. anxiety and depression, usually they go together. Which she mentioned a little bit of that. I, I'm getting to be a little clinical here. But, you know, when she talked about not being able to even get in the car and pick the kids up from school. Right. You know, that's right on the line between depression symptoms and anxiety symptoms. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of us don't understand unless you've been through it in some capacity. Right. You know, or have, and it's not that you have to physically go through it yourself, but have a family member. Like yeah. I used to always say my mother was such a worry wart. She didn't have anxiety, but she worried about everything. Yeah. And then when she moved up here from Florida, she wound up with um, fibromyalgia, which they all thought was in her head. Like nobody believed her. They all thought it was just, you know, mm -hmm. and it probably is a form of anxiety that caused it or brought it on. Mm -hmm. But if you don't experience it yourself. It's really hard to understand. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and then to see that person that's experiencing it to share it with somebody who doesn't understand is right. very challenging. Yep. I, I had, um, I still get anxiety uh, to the point where. I feel like I, chest pains, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, but like when it first happened, I was much younger and I did go to the, the hospital. I did go, I, I thought I was having a heart attack or something. Right. And you know, they checked me all like, no, you're having anxiety. And putting a, 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 a title to it um, made me calm down. Okay, nothing's wrong with my heart. Right. And like even now, I mean, there's, I've had a lot of reasons to have anxiety through the years with stuff that I went through with my son and I, I, I just I've had a lot of anxiety, my husband and so on and so forth. But um, I, I now when I do get it, I pray, mm -hmm. you know, and I breathe. I do deep breathing and slowly it does go away. Mm -hmm. So I have learned how to deal with it. And if it didn't go away, I would go to the emergency room. But I, I've, I've, I'm more aware of it and, and what, it, what it is like. Because um, I've had it the last few days ever since this, this girl died. Because it was just so... Yeah. There's a whole group of us. We call ourselves the Navy Girls. Because we've all stayed in contact. And it's like, she's the first one out of the group now that died. Mm -hmm. And we're all like, oh my gosh. We can't believe Marie died. You know, we, we really... Oh, we're all kind of upset, very upset by it. Yeah. So, but it's you know, yeah, learning to take the deep breaths, turn it over to God. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just help me be peaceful. Let me go to my Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> Let me read my book. You know, you have to, you have to distract yourself. Yes. Yeah. Right. In I positive never, ways. <laughs> I never experienced anxiety until uh, COVID hit, and then I really really experienced it. And what helped me was praying and deep breathing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know if, if I didn't have my, my faith and know how to pray, I don't know if I would have made it out okay. And then to get it on top of everything. But that's, that's you know, that's what's kept me sane is, is my praying. Yes. Knowing that, all right, here I am. I've got it now. Get me through this, you know? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah, but I've never, I never experienced anxiety before, and I never really had a true understanding until just recently. Wow. Yeah, I, I think COVID, you know, very much increased its angst because it's so real. Mm -hmm. you know, it was such a real way. And it still is. Still but, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's definitely. So yeah. then he goes on to talk about principles for dealing with serious illness. Trust that my life belongs to God, serve others, live one day at a time, give thanks for each day, remember the death and resurrection of Jesus. So as you imagine the difficulties of facing serious illness, which of these feels like the most difficult to do, which is surprising, and it, which, if any, are you following now? <clears throat> Mm 
I try to follow all of them. Yeah. Particularly living one day at a time. I can't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, you know, having the rheumatoid arthritis, and I do also have fibromyalgia. Um, it, it's limited. It's, it has limited me in things that I've been able to do, especially as I've, got, I've gotten older. And so, the serve others is um, mm -hmm. something I struggle with. I would like to be doing more. Mm -hmm. um, I have done more. I mean, I used to work with the youth. You know, I, I, when I worked at the church, I used to do the food pantry. Um, there, there was more. I did more, and and that that right now that I'm, I'm limited what I could do. I mean, I couldn't even get to uh, bell practice last night. Yes, but you don't realize, but you, right, but you are you are um, a blessing to others now because you're participating in this Bible study and you're sharing your feelings. So when this goes back out on Facebook and YouTube. People are listening to our comments. And I think it's so important that we do have this dialogue going back and forth because people will listen to this and then they'll, they'll think about the questions and how we answered them. And so I think it affects others. So you are doing a service. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good point. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's Stephen ministers also. I keep yes, reminding yes, myself absolutely. of that. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, and come on, Donna, just who you are, all your things you put on Facebook and everything. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, all of these little it's things. The, it's, I used to be able to do more, you know, it just. Uh, yeah. You know, but you can't yeah. be discouraged about that. Yeah. You know, you I are, know. I know. You are doing a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Your heart is in the right place, Donna. <laughs> Thank you. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right, let's see what we have next. Okay. Oh, now we're getting on to some heavy stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a very, very long uh, session. Yeah, I don't know how much more that is. Yes, happened. I know. We're, uh, That's a okay. long. good session. So okay. I needed it. <laughs> okay. For we know that if the earthly yeah. tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, when we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan under our burden. Because we wish not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us, must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. Hmm. So, in what ways is this vision different from the, what we see in popular culture? What beliefs about death and the afterlife are expressed or implied? In what way does this scripture offer comfort? Mm. I have to say that the reason I wanted to read that passage of scripture is that it uh, reminded me of the second time that I was uh, having to deal with death in my own experience. <clears throat> and that was one morning uh, around two or three in the morning when I heard a lot of commotion from downstairs. And it turned out that uh, uh, my, my aunt, who was the youngest of uh, the uh, children of my grandparents, uh, had died of a cerebral hemorrhage in the hospital. And uh, the family was gathering around our dining room table uh, to talk about the whole thing. And the pastor came, Pastor Shea came. It must have been three o'clock in the morning. And I sat at the top of the stairs and I listened. And that was a passage of scripture hmm. that he read. Hmm. Ah. Wow. 
How old were you again? You were... I can't recall. Oh. Ten, maybe. Yeah. Wow. Well, I remember my pastor coming when my mother-in-law died, two o'clock in the morning, and was with us 10 minutes later and sat with us through the night and was there in the morning to help us at the funeral home. Wow. My pastor. That's you, Pastor Hill. <laughs> it was always a that was such a comfort. That's where I learned it. Yeah, two o'clock in the morning. Wow. So, it kind of the interesting thing about it is the reference to a tent, and tents uh, are by their very nature uh, temporary. Mm. So, when we think of things as being that sort of thing, uh, it helps us to uh, put things in perspective. There's some things that are temporary and some things that are eternal. <laughs> but it is different from the visions we see in popular culture. Um, there are a lot of people who, uh, when they think about death in popular culture, uh, have very strange ideas. Um, they come up with all kinds of theological statements and come up with all kinds of uh, statements about heaven, about angels, about all kinds of things like that. Um, you know, it's a different vision, and the thing that's that I've noticed as a pastor uh, in recent months, recent years actually, is that there is much more of an emphasis on celebrating the life of a person, mm -hmm. uh, which um, I can understand the the feelings uh, that that people are, are feeling at that time, but it is a different way of thinking about the loss that they've had, and. Uh, I just, I, you know, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. But it seems to me like uh, sometimes if you celebrate, when somebody dies, if you celebrate life, you may be ignoring the fact that you've lost someone. And that's not a great thing either. Well, there's a lot to think about when you think about visions and popular culture. And uh, believe me, with all the Netflix we've been watching in the past uh, <laughs> Uh, 12 yeah. months, uh, we've seen many, many images uh, of how people deal with, uh, with the reality of, of suffering and death. So um, anyway, we, yeah. our time is running out, yeah, so we have to move, move on. on. Okay. Yeah, here we go again. Okay. Three okay. questions to think about, and then we need to move on. When have you seen good emerge from events that seem destructive? What comfort have you found in trusting that God works for good, even as terrible situations how does this truck reflect awe and reverence for God? Mm -hmm -hmm. Yeah, that number two, I think, is uh, for me, is the uh, is what I often will tell people, but I often encourage them to think of the fact that you're not going to find um, God working for the good right now, especially in a terrible situation. It may be something that you're only going to find uh, sometime in the future, and perhaps even when you're least expecting it. Yeah. But that's our faith. That's what we believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> These are a lot of questions. So a lot of questions. We, we should pick this up next time we get together. All right. Well, if you want to do that. Yeah, I think that would okay. be good to think okay. about. You know, think about these questions. What did you, uh, have you learned to be less afraid through the study? Right. What does it mean to be living without being controlled by fear? And share something that you take away from the study has been helpful in addressing fear and or anxiety. Uh, is there anything that you want to say about that last question right now? Well, I think I think it's been very comforting. I, I think all of it really yeah. has been a, so putting it in in a perspective. Yeah, yeah, it strikes me as a serendipitous in the sense that you know um, every time I saw uh, this particular um, Adam Hamilton uh, piece, 
uh, in the, the resources I was looking at, I, I, I completely went away from it. It was like, I don't want to think about that. I want to talk about that and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, when we actually start getting into it, begin to realize that that's something that's very important, uh, especially in the past year. So we have a closing prayer. Closing prayer. Shall we say it together? Lord of the life Lord and conqueror of death, death, you have shown us how, how to confront the fears, fears that we face each day. day. From, From the, the terrors, terrors of the, the night, night the future we cannot see. see. You have, have promised to be with us. We, we thank you for the community we have shared together and the strength we have drawn from each other. We go forth, live unafraid, with love for you and for our neighbors. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. Okay. Now I'm going to uh, and there we go. Uh, I was going to add on, but I didn't have time to do that. I was going to add on uh, uh, the clip from uh, Amy Jo Levine about the uh, study that we're going to begin next week. And uh, I just didn't get time to do that, but it's uh, we showed it on Sunday uh, as part of the uh, Sunday service. So I'll probably show it on Ash Wednesday too at, at the end of the service or something like that. So we'll be working on that next week on Tuesday. Very good. All right. Yep. Well, it's been fun being together. Yep. yep. Yes. Oh, so fourth discussion. Full of courage and hope in these uncertain times. All right. All right, take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.